standing on the promises of Christ my King, through eternal ages and his praises sing. Glory in the highest, I will shout and sing, standing on the promises of God.
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, wake up. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let us go to the grave of the goodness of our God. For our God is good all the time, at every time, anytime. God is good. And it's good to be in the house of the Lord again. It is wonderful to see each and every one of you here at the New Beginnings United Methodist Church. I am the Reverend Dr. John Baldwin, serving as senior pastor here. And I am so grateful that you have come in to worship with us today. I know that we are in a season where God is shaking up the church. Yes. Not just the church here in our location, but the church all yes. across the world. Yes. The yes. church is being posed with questions that it has ignored for centuries. But we are having to answer those questions today. Yes. The church is being challenged in ways we never thought we would be challenged. Mm -hmm. But God's spirit is prevailing even in the midst of the challenges. And so we celebrate and thank God for even those things which come against us in this season. Yes. I'm grateful that you are here because we are continuing to grow together in this a place of possibilities. Yes, Lord. We believe that this yes. is a house where God is transforming lives. Yes. With us through our mission, our ministry, our worship, God is doing great things to teach us to be a better people for the great God we serve. Yes, Lord. I'd like to say welcome to all of our visitors. Amen. For those who are maybe visiting with us for the first time or are returning back, if you're tuning in for the first time, you stopped by to visit us here at New Beginnings, whether you're joining us via YouTube or on Facebook, we're so glad to have you checking in and worshiping with us today. We pray that through this worship experience, because it's supposed to be an experience, yes, yes. that God will touch you and in some way encourage you to continue to grow as a disciple of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. If you would please listen in for our morning announcements. I want to thank all those who worked diligently this week to make sure that we had a successful candidate forum. Mm -hmm. uh, I can't say not only was I honored that we hosted it here, but I was really proud of New Beginnings United Methodist Church because we held that forum in our church, at our Amen. church, for our community. Uh, it's a testament of our faith, of our beliefs, and how we seek to lead in our community. And I thank you all and thank the coordinators uh, who pulled that together, Sister Linda Bellamy, and the entire team, whether you serve on hospitality, security, work the parking lot, whatever, help to put snacks together. If you were the moderator, Sister Eula Thompson, uh, thank you so much for helping to make that event a success. I received some great feedback uh, from it, and so I am honored and grateful for those who helped to, uh, to pull it off. We are shifting this week uh, into our new Bible study books. If you have not picked up your copy, please do so by stopping by the church office at your earliest convenience. Attention all United Methodist men. The United Methodist men will meet immediately following worship today. That is immediately following worship today here in the sanctuary to my left, your right. If you would please gather immediately following the benediction today. We have a number of things that are going on with our children and youth. First, I want to say thank you to those who participated and supported the children and youth with their chili sale on last week. Uh, we will be hosting a couple of events this month for our children and youth. The first one is tomorrow. It is our Chat and Chill session. For those who don't know, Chat and Chill is a time where uh, the children and youth get to come and sit down with their pastor and talk about the things that are going on in their lives. Whatever that may be, however their life is shaping up, things that are great, things that are challenging at school, and we encourage them to come and just have a great conversation, uh, have a little bit of fun with their pastor. We call those our Chat and Chill sessions. Well, tomorrow we're hosting Sunday, Monday, where we'll be having ice cream Sundays on Monday uh, with our children. That's anyone 11 years of age and younger. And so starting at 6 p.m., we will be kicking off our Sunday, Monday, ch Monday chat and chill session. And we will do so in two weeks again for our youth. So we encourage you to come out. Also, later this month, we are hosting our community Easter egg hunt. And so we're encouraging all of our members and friends to donate candy. If you want to do financial donations to help with the prizes, uh, please do so. You can do so by seeing one of our youth coordinators or by checking in at the church office. Beginning next week, you can begin to bring your gently used yard sale donations to the church. 
If you are needing more space in your house and you have things that are gently used and you need to declutter that space, we welcome you to bring those and donate them to the church so that they can be a part of the community yard sale on April 13th. If you desire to purchase a slot, you can do so for a $50 donation or you can give a $50 donation for a slot and you can uh, sell whatever items you desire to sell and keep those funds for yourself as long as those items fall within something that is acceptable to be sold on church property. Amen. Last week, this will be the last week that we will be leave the forms in the vestibule. If you did not get a chance to make your contributions or your selections on our programming survey, please stop by the table in the vestibule and pick up a copy, fill it out, and leave it on the table today. Uh, this, this list and this poll will set the agenda of kind of the programs we want to develop in the church over the next few years. And so we want the congregation's feedback on how we are moving forward. Also, continue to brainstorm because we will soon be collecting those special names for our Campus B um, location. So if you have ideas or suggestions for what we should name the facility, please prepare to make those uh, suggestions and provide them in the vestibule in the box that will be outside in that, in that space. Our fundraisers for our renovation project are continuing to go on. Uh, through April 13th, you can participate in our raffle. We have a raffle with two grand prizes. One is $1,000 cash, and the second is an 85-inch television. Raffle tickets are $5 each, and they are moving quickly. Also, we're encouraging everyone to participate in our Linden offering this year, where we're asking you to make a sacrificial donation during the season of Lent. Uh, by multiple of 40, whatever that is, whatever God places on your heart, you do so in obedience to God and make that contribution. All of our Lent offering will go towards our Campus B renovation project. Now, I push those hard today, and I encourage you to take part in each of those fundraisers that you just heard about because I have a special uh, announcement that has come in this week and a charge that has come to us this week. Uh, we know that two weeks ago when we had our charge conference, our superintendent uh, blessed us when he heard that we had raised just under $20,000 and made a commitment to uh, of a $20,000 donation, match donation to the church. Okay, y'all remember that? Amen. And last Sunday, I stood and I announced that we have received that check for twenty thousand dollars. Amen. Amen. We have this week received a challenge that if we can raise an additional twenty thousand dollars over the next two months, mm -hmm. that we will receive an additional match donation of twenty thousand dollars towards Amen. our renovation project. Amen. And so I'm asking you all, all who are able, dig in, call your friends, get on board and help us to reach our goals of providing a space for our community to grow, learn, and develop together in Campus B. $20,000 is our goal, and if we pull together, we can do it in the next two months. Amen. Amen? Amen. All right, let's get to it. <laughs> so we will be celebrating the Sacrament of Holy Communion today. And so if you're tuning in with us, we encourage you to go and prepare elements, one representative of the body and one representative of the blood and participate as we go through the litany and celebrate communion together. If you're in the sanctuary and you did not pick up a communion cup or a set of elements, when you came in, if you would raise your hand, one of our ushers will bring one to you uh, to make sure you have one available when we get to that portion of our worship experience. I do want to say uh, to my January and my February birthdays, I owe you an apology because we did not sing happy birthday at the end of January or at the end of February. Uh, but we are going to do a quarterly birthday celebration and you will receive a personalized birthday invitation to your own birthday party. It will be held here at the church on Tuesday, March 19th. It will be a family fun night at the church and we're just gonna celebrate and have fun together. So I'm encouraging you to mark your calendars for March 19th and we're gonna celebrate all of our January, February, and March birthdays this quarter. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right. Amen. We wanna to continue to pray for all of our known sick and shut-in members. The list is posted in the hallway on the bulletin board, 
And I encourage you, if you are going through a season of infirmity or if you are in a season of bereavement, uh, make sure the church knows about it so that we can add you to the list and continue to lift you up in prayer. We still believe that the effectual fervent prayer of the righteous can and will avail much. Let us prepare our hearts for our call to worship. Linton Travelers, why are you here? We gather to do the work of worship. Linton Travelers, what happens when we gather to worship? We listen and proclaim. We sing and pray. We repent and we encourage. Linton Travelers, how do we do the work of worship? We bring all that we are to be present to God and one another. Linton Travelers, what work does God do in worship? God raises us up so that we can delight in life together with God and one another. Let the travelers, let us come worship God together. Come, let us worship God together. Let us pray. Holy God, we come before you now with heads bowed and humble hearts, recognizing, O oh God, that we are at your mercy and that we need an outpouring of your grace. We understand, O oh God, that we have sinned and come short of all that you expected us to do and be, but yet and still your love prevails in our lives. You touched us this morning and allowed us to rise with reasonable portions of life, health, and strength. And for these things, God, we say thank you. Amen. We thank you, God, for providing for us in ways that only you can provide. For keeping us, O oh God, from hurt, harm, and danger, God. For strengthening us, O oh God, and even stirring deep within us the gift of faith so that we can believe you and trust you as we seek to serve you in this world. So, God, today as we come together and we lift our hands and open our mouths, as we even, God, show up as acts of appreciation, we ask that you would inhabit our praises, O oh God. Fill this atmosphere with your glory, O oh God. Fill this atmosphere with your glory, O oh God. The kind of glory, God, that allows shackles to fall off of minds. The kind of glory, God, that causes those who are faint at heart to believe again. The kind of glory, God, that restores relationships and families. The kind of glory, God, that breaks the yokes of addiction. The kind of glory, God, that sets the captive free. God, we pray today that you would fill this house with your glory. The glory that makes all that is wrong right again. Help us, God, to grow in your grace as we seek to worship and praise your name. It's to the glory and honor of your son, Jesus' name. We pray and ask these blessings. Let every heart say amen, 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 amen. and amen. amen.
He kept my enemies away. He let the sun shine through a cloudy day. And he rocked me in the cradle of his arms. When he knew that I had been back. Yes, Lord, and everything that is done for me. My soul. My soul. Just cries hallelujah. Thank you, God, for saving me. 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 We come now to affirm our faith for the recitation of the Apostles' Creed. It is item 881 in our United Methodist hymnal. That is the purple hymnal that is in the back of the pew. Item 881. It is one of the ways that we join in with others of the faith around the world to declare what we believe. If you are able, I invite you to please stand to your feet. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From this he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Today's scripture lesson is taken from the Gospel of John, chapter 2. Verses 13 through 22. John chapter 2, verses 13 through 22. I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple with the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, what sign can you show us for doing this? And Jesus answered them, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, this temple has been under construction for 46 years, and you will raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. 
in this Lenten season as we focus on our repentance and connecting in right standing with God, we acknowledge that all have sinned and come short of the glory. We acknowledge that we are all imperfect and that even in the midst of our failures, God's love is steadfast, abundant, and true. And so today, I invite you to pray with me a prayer of confession and to hear with fresh ears and sincere hearts the words of blessing and assurance. Let us pray. With hearts of sorrow, we come before you, God. We come to confess what you already know. We have failed to keep your laws again and again. We have followed our own selfish will again and again. We have done this rather than following your holy life giving will for our lives. God, we have twisted your decrees and your institutions to suit our preconceptions and our own personal interests rather than your own. So we ask, forgive us, O oh God, and cleanse us from hidden faults that the words of our mouths, the meditations in our hearts, that they may be acceptable in your sight because you are our rock and our redeemer. God shows steadfast love. God shows steadfast love. Yes. And blesses to the thousandth generation those who follow God's ways. Yes. In love, God sent Jesus to bless and redeem God's people. God forgives us our sins yes. and restores each of us to new life. Let us rejoice in God's mercy.
Time that has, in many ways, <clears throat> shown people a depiction of Jesus that is not our traditional understanding of who Jesus is and how Jesus functions. 
if you are like me, you grew up seeing usually two to three pictures of Jesus. One, Jesus was seated at the table for the Last Supper with his disciples. Two, you had just that bust of Jesus that was kind of like shoulders and head that was sitting there with this peaceful, angelic look in Jesus' eyes. However, whether those eyes were blue or brown, you know, depending on the house you were in. <laughs> or you had that picture of Jesus uh, hanging on the cross. That's right. And even in the picture of Jesus hanging on the cross, Jesus <coughs> appears to be at peace. Yes, that's right. And it seems like all is well. You know, as we get older and we learn more about the situation, we're like, ooh, crucifixion was not a very peaceful way to go. All right. And so with all of those pictures telling us a vision of who and how Jesus was, many of us only grew to know the Jesus of peace, mm -hmm. of calm, right. the Jesus who is mild-mannered. Good to see you, Charlene. The Jesus who only lives to make things right, All right. but doesn't really do much disturbing mm -hmm. situations. Mm -hmm. And then at some point we come across this story in the text <coughs> that doesn't align with this image of a peaceful, mm -hmm. right. mild-mannered Jesus. Mm -hmm. right. Here we have a Savior who comes into Jerusalem to worship in the time of Passover, and when he gets in, as most of the Jews do, they go through their normal ritual practices. These practices included ritual bathing, so they had baths because they had to be clean before they went into certain parts of the temple and went in to worship. They had these bathing stations. They had these places where they had to go and get their animal sacrifices and go and make atonement for you know their sins and things before they participated in worship. Jesus goes through all the traditional things, but Jesus walks into this one place in the temple, sees something he doesn't like, and the mild-mannered, peaceful, kind, right. soft-spoken right. Jesus that talks like this right. mm -hmm. yes. turns over tables yes. 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 Mm. and does my favorite part. <laughs> he looks around, yes, sees some leather yes, straps, mm -hmm. leather straps, yes, pieces of leather. He doesn't get one, yes, sir. but the Bible says that he gets a few, yes, sir. and he actually brings them together. Y'all yeah. don't say somebody prepared to want somebody. <laughs> 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 right. 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 Yes, He's sitting there, and he brings the African man. You know, if you're in there, and you see this man walk over and grab these three leather straps. And you just want to do business you know, you know, like I'm gonna be honest. And he just started praying. And look at <laughs> Then he turns around and he begins to yell and drive out the people who are selling in the temple. Here is the mild-mannered, soft-spoken Jesus popping a whip, mm -hmm. pouring out people's money, mm -hmm. and telling people to get out mm -hmm. of the place of worship. Mm -hmm. This expression of passion in Jesus is not one that sits well with the image of the quiet, passive, Docile of Jesus. And if we are not careful, we will slip into a place where we forget that God does get disappointed and angry. Amen. 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 That God is not always pleased with everything that we do. That God is calling us to get things right. Bear with me, if you will, as I talk to you from the subject matter, may the odds be in your favor. All right. May the odds be in your favor. When we look at 
this story and we look at Jesus going into the temple and turning over the tables and driving the people and the animals out, we find this expression of Jesus' life in all four of the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. If you go to Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you will see that this normally takes place after the triumphal entry in the text, when he goes into Jerusalem riding on the donkey. And so for most theologians and most church calendars, we don't even talk about this text until the week after Palm Sunday. But in John's gospel, he places it much earlier in the text. While we are going through this Lenten season, there are many of us who are like, why would we have this text to look at and focus on so early? Why can't we talk about it on Monday after Palm Sunday when Jesus is cleansing the temple? It is because John's placement of this particular story of Jesus' life comes early in the text because John wants to focus on what is important to Jesus. That in addition to what Jesus does when he's in the outskirts healing and reviving and teaching people on the mountain and when he goes down by the sea and he causes people to get up from their beds of affliction, in addition to all of these things that Jesus does out there in the world, there are some things that Jesus wants to get right inside the place of worship. Sometimes even those of us who are in leadership in the church, we can become consumed with focusing on the work that we need to do outside the walls, down the street, across the city, maybe even in mission trips around the world. But we forget that Jesus also requires that we get things right in the house. In the house. This is a huge expression of what God requires of God's people even when they come to worship. When Jesus enters into the temple, Jesus sets order in the place of worship. Jesus sets order in the place of worship. Order in our day and age has become a little bit taboo. We simply think of order usually as a structure or a systemic way of doing things. And so whenever things don't seem like they can be anticipated, we automatically believe that they are out of order. Mm -hmm. If we don't know what's coming next, or we don't believe that you know things are progressing as they should, or it's taking too long for this person to finish, or that was not starting on time, we assume that there's just no order, there's chaos here. But order when it comes to the things of God is to have things in their proper perspective, to be prioritized in the manner that they should be. It is to practice what you do in a way that pleases God, first and foremost. It was out of order in the story of the Good Samaritan for the Levites to step over the person who was hurt and in need of assistance. But it was in order for the Samaritan to stop, Mm -hmm. tend to his wounds, Mm -hmm. and get the hurt man some help. It was out of order for those who are supposed to be on God's agenda in the family, building God's name to take their brother, beat him and leave him in a ditch and sell him off into slavery. But it was in order for even someone who doesn't know God to recognize a special gift in one of God's children Mm -hmm. and to invite Joseph to interpret the the dreams of Pharaoh. Order in God's house is not just about our timing and our structuring. Mm -hmm. It is about keeping the priority for what God wants in the place where God wants it. It is the establishment of a standard for the people and the places that belong to God. A standard is a level of quality or attainment. Can y'all stay with me for just a second? A standard is identified as a common ground because it is often the space where people come to recognize together that this is the bare minimum of what things should be. 
It is an idea or a thing used to measure a norm or a model in comparative evaluations. A standard is what is expected. But the word standard, as we have come to know it, is often misused. Yes, we know what standard means, but let me tell you where standard came from. The word standard, standard, comes from Middle English. And it was used to refer to a stand or a post that was put in place and that usually bore the flag of a dominating entity. When the standard was put in place, it was a mark and a symbol that up until this point we have accomplished. We have developed up until this point. This is ours and we have achieved up unto this point. And so whenever persons came by, the standard they recognize that anything below, beyond, behind that was already achieved and we were not to go backwards, but we were to at least maintain where we are. In many of our circles, we have used this term standard to just mark what we will accept and what we will not based on our preferences and not based on levels of achievement. Ah. We use the word standard to identify what we prefer and what we like, what is quality that we will accept based on our preferences and not on the developmental status of a standard. When you realize that a standard marks a place of progression, you understand that there was once a point where the standard was not established. When you realize that a standard marks a place of progression, you understand that it marks a place where the standard was once not established. When you understand that a standard is a mark in a progression, you know that just as it progressed to this point, things can also progress beyond it. Did you get that? And so while this may be a place that we honor and that we appreciate, the standard is not to be worshipped. It is to be developed because the standard can move. Yeah. All right. The standard only moves if we push it forward, if we work to move it ahead and establish a new standard for progress. When Jesus comes into the temple and he sets order in the place of worship, the problem is not that the people are buying and selling in the temple. That is a very surface reading of the text. The problem is that the people are buying and selling in the temple for their own personal convenience and not for the glorification of God. That is the perversion of the standard. You see, according to the book of Leviticus in chapters 1, 6, and 8, people are required to bring a burnt offering. According to Leviticus 2 and 6, people are required to have a grain offering. According to Leviticus chapter 3 and chapter 7, people are required to give a peace offering. According to Leviticus 4, 5, 6, 8, and 16, people are required to bring a sin offering. According to Leviticus 5, 6, and 7, people are required to bring a trespass offering. And to bring these offerings from great distances was often a great burden on people and would hinder people from coming to worship in spirit and in truth. I need us to get this because I'm going somewhere with it. You see, giving a sacrifice, bringing an offering, giving what God requires was always a part of the worship experience. It is not always supposed to be ultimately convenient for you, but you are supposed to have to give something and to offer something when you show up in God's house. That's why you can't always take the low road. You can't always do what's the most convenient. You can't always stay at home. You can't always dress the way you want to. You can't always show up whenever you want to. You are required to bring some level of sacrifice when you come to God's house. And the ultimate sacrifice is to bring a life submitted to God. But in this act of worship and coming to present yourself in worship for God, the people in this time had to travel on foot. Sometimes walking miles, weeks, days. Can you imagine walking through a rough, 
dry desert terrain, full of a goat, trying to get a cow to come with you so you can make a sacrifice. I can imagine that there are some people like us that if we had to bring a goat to worship, we'd stay at home. <laughs> Matter of fact, if we could put a pigeon in our pocket, we still wouldn't put that pigeon in our pocket and come to church. Because they just want too much. They're doing too much. They're asking for too much. It's just too much of a headache. And so what they did was they set up a system outside the temple that said, if you could just get here and bring your money, you can buy a goat. So you can go in to worship God. The setting up of the selling at the temple in this particular place was for a convenience for the worshipers. It was not sinful. It was not bad. It was good. And it was to support the standard of what God required. The perversion came when people started buying and selling for their own benefit and not for the sake of helping people to get to worship. Now we get into something good, okay? Because they started to develop criteria that was not based on a pure heart and a desire to worship God. They said, you know what? You can come in here and worship if you look like me. You can come in here and worship. Matter of fact, I'll sell you a goat. I'll sell you a goat for $2. I'm going to sell them a goat for 15 Because I don't want them in here anyway. I'm going to meet them at the door, smile at them, and shake their hands because they come from the same family that I do. But those folk over there, I'm going to scowl at them, and it's going to be a little harder for them to get in here and worship today. They decided that the people from different regions would have to pay more money than others from other regions. And so when they got in there, the people who were buying and selling at the table were not giving equitable and equal care to everybody who came to worship God. They were doing it off of their own preferences and God says that's the way of the world where the standards move for different people. That's the way of the world where you only give access to the people you like. That's the way of the world where you only treat people well if you are comfortable being around them. That's the way of the world. That's not what I require of my people. That's not supposed to be acceptable here. That's the way of the world when you judge people based on where they've been and what you know about them. Instead of offering them free and abundant grace and mercy so that they can come and worship in spirit and in truth. That's the way of the world. He says, not so in my house. That's what these do in their end. Where they make the entire bar and trade system about them and what they want and what they like and where they're going and what they're trying to have. This is about me. Jesus walks in. He set order because he says, this is not the way my house is supposed to be. People are serving in my house, but they're serving themselves and not my name. They're serving for their own pleasures and not for the building of my kingdom. Jesus identifies that there has been a perversion of the standard. And many of us don't recognize when the standards in our lives and in our places of worship have been tainted. We will easily allow the enemy to come in and set up camp because we only have one idea of how the enemy functions. Mm-hmm. Only one idea of how the enemy functions. Right. Jada, come here. Huh. Come here. Yes, come up here. I need two more. <laughs> come on, come on, come on. Move fast. <laughs> Radish, come up. Come here. Come on, Radish. Yeah, come on. I need y'all to stand down here in front of the altar. Stand across the front. Come on, Lindsay. Face the people. Come on. Come on, you come on. Come on, come on. Come on. Amen. Come on in here. Face the court. As the body of Christ, 
the people of God, when we come and stand together in God's house, we are connected. Take a piece, pass it down. Hold on to it, pass it down. Pass it down, everybody gets a piece. And it is the blood of Jesus and the work of Christ that holds us together. Amen. Amen. No one is more entitled to a piece of this blood than anyone else. All right. Amen. It is handed to us, it is given to us freely because of God's love of us. Amen. We hold our place, we have our place because it was given to us freely. When we start thinking about the attacks of the enemy that come against the body of Christ, we expect that the enemy will always come in and try to get us to let go of our rope and get out of line. We expect that the enemy will always come and try to pull us out of place and pick us off. But that means some of y'all don't know how to do strategic fighting. Because if I really want to war against this line getting anywhere and going anywhere, I don't pick off individuals. All right. All right. I don't take them out. Because <laughs> yes. sometimes with fewer people, they can go further and be more nimble. All right. Yes. All right. Instead, I confound the people who are still connected and I keep their minds, their heart, their feet, right. their bodies always tied up, tangled up in something that's not allowing them to progress in the ways that God would have them to go. Yes. Yes. And so sometimes, the people who are connected by the blood, who have power and privilege because they were called by God and given opportunity by God, they are challenged. And they wake up one day and all of a sudden, they can't see nothing. All right, all right. I don't see how we're going to get that done. I don't see why the church is going down here and serving in this way. I don't see where we're going next. I don't see what's going to happen with the conference. I don't know what's going to happen with the denomination. I don't know why we started this ministry. I don't see a purpose in this. I don't know what we're supposed to do. And so we're still connected to the body. But when God says, hey, I'm ready for y'all to move in the ways of ministry. I'm ready for you to go and do the things that I want you to do. You got somebody holding the rope who had not let go, but they can't see where they're going. So they can't move either. Y'all remember this? Yes. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Some of y'all got some years on you. <laughs> we go to people and we say, all right, put your hand through the middle. That's right. <laughs> Which one? Uh-huh. And you just do that, too. And then you do that, right? All right. Have to begin. 
begin to engage politics again. I know you don't see it, but we have to be that. We have to be that because when we go to the polls, the people in the church are just as ignorant as the people outside. We don't know who to vote for, what to vote for, why to vote for anything. We just show up and say, oh, what color are they? Oh, the, the Republicans are righteous, so we're going to vote straight Republicans. They, they are under God's ways. Oh, no, they Democrats. They for the black people, so we just going to vote all the... You haven't talked to them, listened to them, read up on them, studied them, or anything. You haven't looked at what they've done in the past or what they're trying to do for you, and now you look like the blind, lame, stuck, hands tied body of Christ. Right. And God says, go forward, everybody, move forward. Go transform the world. Go forward. Everybody walk forward. Go, 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 go. He didn't even move. You know why? Because he can't see. <laughs> She moved forward but moved back. Why? Because she stuck behind something that doesn't go anywhere. That's right. And so in all of this, the standard that God intended for us to function as in the world has been compromised. Yeah. And so when we start talking about how do we become the church that is viable, that is relevant in this day and age, we can and need to look out there, but we also got to say, how do we get blinders off the people in here? How do I get the folks in here who are tied up free? Yeah. How do I get people the access they need, the mobility and direction they need to walk around the things that aren't going anywhere and aren't going to become anything oh anymore? Right. How do I help people to turn the tables over and stop using the spaces of worship for their own self-benefit? Yes. Yes. But to promote the body of Christ yes. As the agenda of God. Yeah. Yeah. Thank y'all. Get each other free. Mm. Get each other free. I got to go finish preaching. You got to, you got to, help, got to get on time. You got to help something. You got to help something. This is not a part of my sermon, but if you pay attention, yes, sir. you'll realize that it's the folk on the line who got to set each other free. Because yeah. there's only so much the preacher can do. You got to get to work. Thank y'all. Y'all go back to your seats. Yeah. The enemy's work is against the progression of God's kingdom. Stealing vision. Killing motivation. Destroying chances of us moving forward is not just about taking lives. Not about putting them in the ground or in caskets. It's about getting people to stand where they are and not move. Yes. To not be willing to grow or to serve. Mm. To be so afraid that we will not even go outside of our personal boxes to be the body with people who are in need. Yes. The standard has been compromised. And unfortunately, it's not just compromised out there. It's compromised in here. We as the body of Christ have to put the unusual, sacred nature of God back as a priority. Whatever it takes to show the love of God, whatever it takes to show the grace and the mercy of God, we got to be committed to doing that. Whatever it takes to help people see, to live a better quality of life, we have to be committed to that. We have to talk about immigration and get involved. We have to talk about the displaced and the homeless, and we have to create spaces for them to live. We have to go and talk about economic empowerment, gainful employment. We have to talk about job readiness just as much as we talk about praise and worship, yeah. prayer and fasting, yeah. giving your tithes. Yeah. Because this is a part of being the body and being the standard of God's love, power, and grace in a world <clears throat> that's stuck at a faulty standard. There are people who are still hungry for the living bread, but we gotta kick some tables over in order to help them get there. Right. Yeah. There are people who are still looking for Jesus and who have walked a long way to get here, but we have to be willing to break some whips and drive out people who are blocking their path. 
We have to be the body of Christ. And if that means we got to step outside of our docile, peaceful nature so that the kingdom of God grows, then so be it. So the question comes, and I'm done. Why are you talking about this? Why are we working for this? Why are we giving away food and doing these things? And if you missed it, go back and watch the video. Because the answer is because the Spirit of God is upon me. Amen. And this is what I've been anointed to do. Amen. If you're asking the question, why are we working so hard? It's because God didn't call us to serve ourselves, but to serve God's kingdom and do the work in this land. If you're asking and wondering why are we working like this, I tell you, because Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. If you want to ask why must we focus on these things when other churches down the street and around the corner are not focused on them, I'm going to ask you a question again. Are you asking me why I'm working or do I love Jesus? If you're asking me why I'm working, the answer is because I love Jesus and I must keep his commandments. If you ask me why I love Jesus, let me tell you why I love him. I love him because almost 2,000 years ago, on a place called Calvary, the God who saw beyond my faults, recognized my needs, decided to take on all sin on his shoulders. He allowed them to drag him from courtroom to courtroom and be accused of things that he did not do. Let me tell you why I love him. Because when he could have said, not me, John needs to go down there and be beaten and put in jail. He never said a mumbling word. But he went and took it like a soul. Let me tell you why I love him. Because almost two years ago, that same God allowed them to whip him all night long when those lashes should have been for me. Come on now. Let me tell you why I'm serving him like I do. I'm serving like I do because I love him. If you want to know why I love him, let me tell you why. I love him because when they had just beaten him all night long, they turned him over and led him up a mountain and hung him on a rock between two feet. And after he had cried out and said it is finished, he dropped down his head to the lock of his shoulders. Let me tell you why I love him. Because he hung, bled, and died. So that I would not have to suffer for the sin that I still commit every day. Let me tell you why I love him. I love him because when I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful soul, very deeply strained within, seeking to rise no more. Pulling down strongholds, I'm casting. 
It's not average. It's not comfortable. But it's God. And I've got to know it. This is why I'm here. This is why we're pushing. This is why we got to take this odd nature, this odd way, this unconventional thing, and push it back to the forefront because God is calling for it now. Oh my God. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Now. Now. Jesus. Now. Doesn't matter how old you are. God, what a word. I don't care how old you are. I don't care what positions and titles you've held in the church. They're good. I'm grateful that you serve. You've been a part of what held us together up until now. But if breath is still in your body, God has more work for you to do. God is calling for you to be a part of what takes us to the next. Don't give up on your opportunity because you're resting on your history. Let God be a part of making you the next part of his legacy. Come and serve the Lord. Doesn't matter how young you are. If everybody else and everywhere else dismisses you, God is calling for you because God loves you. God loves you. God loves you. you. And has placed so much inside of you. Answer the call and show up and do what God is calling for you to do. Doesn't matter where you've been. If we don't get to the rest of it, it's okay. It doesn't matter where you've been. Stop discrediting and dismissing yourself. If God is calling for you, answer the call. Show up and let God use you in only ways that God can. Man, woman, boy, girl, whatever. Let God use you. Give your life to Christ. And if ever you see anybody making it hard for people to worship God, set order. Set order. We can go back and forth about a lot of things, but we can't go back and forth about whether we let people come and worship God. God. Amen. We can't let people stop folk at the door and make it hard for them to see the image of God. You don't know what they walked past or what they walked through to get here. You don't know what it took for them to just make it into the house today. There are some of us who walk from down the street. There are some people who drove 40 miles to get here. They sacrificed to get to the house of God. And the people of God can't make it hard for them to see Jesus. Set order in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 If you're here today and you feel like you've been pressing your way towards Jesus, but there's something that keeps stopping you, I've come to tell you that those obstacles have been removed. They have no power. They cannot control you and they cannot stop you. The same way you're pressing for Jesus, Jesus is pressing for you. God loves you, wants you, is inviting you to be a part of God's family. And all you have to do is believe in your heart and confess Jesus Christ is Lord of your life. And your salvation is yours. If you're here today and you want to make that confession, you can do so by slipping your hand up, standing to your feet, or you can walk to the front. We just want to pray with you and help you to make the best decision of your life to give your life to Christ. We offer Christ to you, oh my brother. We offer Christ to you, my sister. He will give you brand new life, new life abundantly. All you have to do is come. Just come. Come to Christ. If you're here today and my second call is if you need a church home, the New Beginnings United Methodist Church is a great place to be your church family. There are some wonderful people here. 
who are called and gifted by God to be family for folks. They're going to stand with you, cry with you, love you, support you, challenge you, hold you accountable. Ask you, are you growing? Try to help you grow. Because that's what we do when we're in family together. If you're here and you want to join this church, we invite you now. Slip your hand up, stand to your feet, or come to the front.
this to my members here at New Beginnings. Anytime an opportunity like this comes before us and someone says pray, pray like it's your grandson. Pray like it's your child. Pray like you need them to get through. Because when he goes out of this place, he might end up in a relationship with your cousin, your niece, your wife. And if you pray now, might walk into business place with your and might be a better employee or might be a level-headed customer if you pray now. So when we say pray, pray. Pray. Like your life depends on it because he is just like you.
and stewards are coming with the baskets to receive the cups. Feel free to place your cups in the baskets as they come by. Well, I pray today you have been challenged to set order in your place or space of worship again, to prioritize what is most important to God as the most important thing to you, and that you would let that govern your ways of worship. If you would please remember to uh, stop by the table and pick up your announcements that have been prepared in your calendar. Uh, the events for your calendar, they're outside of the lobby. Be mindful of all of our announcements because the ways that we engage the church and engage the world are an extension of our worship. It shows our level of worship. Uh, I want to say thank you again to all of our visitors who have come out to worship with us today. Amen. I pray that you have heard something that encouraged you, challenged you, enlightened you, or heard something new that you hadn't heard before uh, while you were in worship, and that you'll go back and research and look up and see if the pastor knows what he's talking about um, to find out for yourself. We want everyone to grow as disciples of Jesus Christ in this place. Amen? Amen. Well, it's offering time. If you would please prepare your offering. Parents give, we know we give in this house so that we can go out and give in the world. But Lord our God loves a cheerful giver and has promised to give seed to the sower. And so whatever God purposes on your heart for you to give, you pray about it and then serve in obedience. Seek to be obedient to the word of God. Amen. If you prepared your offering, if you would please stand to your feet. All more aid. Your offering is prepared. Please stand to your feet. Remember that the people of the New Beginnings United Methodist Church are transforming lives through mission, ministry, and worship as a prophetic witness for Jesus Christ in the world. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for these gifts and for the givers. We ask, O God, that you would bless our offering and multiply it, that we may continue to do great things in your name. Use these gifts, O God, to build your kingdom and to set in order all that is wrong. You, by the power of your spirit, Lord, make it right, and we shall praise your name. As we prepare to go from this place, O God, but never from your presence, may the sweet communion of your Holy Spirit rest, rule, and abide with us all, now, henceforth, and forever. Till we meet again, let every heart say, Amen. Amen.